Hi, hello, hi. So, today, I'm going to continue in my top surgery series, and we are going to talk about post-op depression. Specifically, I'd like to focus on gender dysphoria, body dysmorphia, and top surgery, and how those three come into play, and how top surgery may actually trigger eating disorder relapses and stuff like that, and how that could affect someone with a past of eating disorders. Before we get into this, I just want to say trigger warning eating disorder, trigger warning surgery, and post-op stuff, and I just want you to be aware of what this video is going to deal with so you're prepared. But I'd also like to possibly touch on just post-op depression in general and some of the other contributors to the post-op depression that I experienced, uh, and how maybe getting into this mind space and understanding this might help you with your post-op depression. So, when I had top surgery, I had this expectation, firstly, that my body dysmorphia would go away, and that that would help me with my eating disorder, and I would just feel so good about my body, and uh, it would solve a lot of my body image issues. And it kind of almost had the opposite effect on me. So there are a lot of reasons why surgery triggered my eating disorder really badly. At the time that I had surgery, my eating disorder was quite bad. I was still battling with it quite a bit, and uh, I was really obsessed with like what I ate and how much I ate and how much I exercised, and um, I was really dysphoric, and I was only like three months on tea. Testosterone actually ended up being what helped my body dysmorphia the most, but that's a different topic for a different video. So firstly, having top surgery was difficult with my eating disorder because one, I wasn't really in charge of what I was eating or when I was eating. Uh, two, I couldn't really move around at all, uh, so there was no physical activity to make me feel better after I ate. Three, it forced me to have a hard stop with my binging and purging cycle, which is not something that I'm, you know, definitely don't encourage that, but it was something that I was actively engaging in prior to surgery and relapsed after surgery, but, you know, during surgery I couldn't, so there was that panic of like, oh, I just ate and now I have to deal with this, ah. And lastly, um, the bloating after surgery, but also the focus shift from my chest to my hip area. So, after surgery, you will most likely be bloated. There are a lot of reasons why, but you know, after surgery, a lot of people are constipated, so not being able to poop makes you bloated. Being put under anesthetic oftentimes has this effect on people of stopping the metabolism, and then it takes a while for you to be able to poop again. And also just like the incisions, um, like I just, I couldn't even force because like the incisions would hurt, but my body was a special case. I just know that bloating after surgery is a thing for a lot of reasons. They do suggest that you start taking stool softeners and laxatives a little before surgery so that they have time to be in your system and kick in so that you don't experience such bad constipation after surgery, but uh, yeah, that didn't work for me. I never posted my post-op reveal for a lot of reasons. Firstly, I was very upset and feeling vulnerable and feeling not okay about a lot of things and about just everything. And I, I just, I didn't want to share any more vulnerability with people at, at that point. I wasn't ready for that. I felt such a loss of control around my surgery and my recovery that the very few things I got to have control over, I just wanted to keep for myself. So my post-op reveal was something that I, I didn't want anyone to see. And so I didn't want Chase to post it. And then I didn't post it. And I just wanted to keep that for myself. I had so little that I got to control after surgery and that that was a big move for me to just be able like no and I was also really self-conscious about my top surgery reveal because I didn't have the reaction that you see online where people cry and it's emotional and they're just overwhelmed with joy I was just like wow <laughs> wow that was all I could say because it was a lot of things firstly it was the like oh finally <laughs> just the not even the like, oh, finally I'm flat, just that finally these bandages are off my body. Finally, I will be free of this situation where I'm in no control whatsoever and I'm at the mercy of the people around me. Finally, I'm just over with this week, like finally. And then there was also the like, I don't feel good about the way that I look. I'm bloated and I'm suddenly noticing my hips and my waist much much more than I did prior to surgery because I was so covered up because of my top dysphoria and my binder made me so like bulky that I didn't realize like, wow, I'm not at all happy with the shape of my body. So there was the wow of like, oh, this is what my body looks like. And then there is a lot of joy, like top surgery was the best thing I ever did for myself, but in no way was it instantaneous joy or relief for me in any way. I didn't get that relief immediately. It took a long time for me to just feel okay because one, it took me so long to heal. So there was so much post-op binding and care that had to go into it that I wasn't expecting and so much more pain than I thought that there would be. And it took me so long to just be able to just wear only a shirt and nothing else. I was really vigilant with my scar treatment because as some of you may know, with having EDS, having really prominent scars is a thing. I have a scar on my leg from like one time that I scratched my leg on my dog's 
cage when I was a kid and it wasn't even that bad. It was legit just like a scrape. And now it's a scar. It is a full bumpy scar on my leg. So I did a lot of work on my chest scars so that they would be as invisible as possible, I guess. Not because I want to hide them, but also just because like scar tissue is quite painful when it builds up. So just to get that to go down was great. So yeah, I didn't share my post-op reveal for a lot of those reasons, but yeah, the post-op bloating definitely contributes to body dysmorphia and also to gender dysphoria. And this whole experience of top surgery triggers all of these things. It causes bloating and it kind of forces your focus to shift from your chest to the other areas of your body that you might not be okay with either because of body dysmorphia or gender dysphoria or both because they really do intersect. Your dysmorphia is making the parts of your body that you're dysphoric about seem a lot more prominent than they are. The next thing that really contributed to my post-op depression was, as I kind of went through in the last videos, was my post-op care and how that experience went for me. There was a lot going on psychologically that I didn't fully understand. Like I understood that I felt like a burden, I understood I didn't feel cared for, I understood that I felt discarded, I understood that I felt like the people I could trust around me weren't able to take care of me or weren't able to focus on my problems the way that I needed them to. That they couldn't go without their needs being taken care of. I felt like the people around me who I've been there for and I'm not I'm not just talking about like the people who went to Florida with me I'm talking about the people in my life who I love and care for who've become my family I felt their absence and I didn't know how to interpret that because going into surgery I was really scared I was terrified because it's the first time that I've traveled without my parents and it's the first time I've ever done anything medical without my mom by my side and it was really scary for me to accept that I was going to go through this without her and a big part of that acceptance process for me was embracing the other people in my life who have become my chosen family and really putting all of my trust in them and knowing that they won't let me down and that like if I need anything I have them all there and I just kind of imagined their priorities to be different because I think I was holding them to the standard of my mom which is not fair because none of these people are my mom. I am not their child, um, it's not their responsibility to love me that way but that's just what I really needed and I didn't have that and coming back from surgery was scary because there were a couple people that I thought could stay with me after surgery because I wasn't sure how I would feel and I realized after surgery like you know I'm not nearly as healed as I should be uh, and I'm not able to move and I'm, I'm not able to do anything and I'm, I'm going to end up opening my incisions if I do too much because my body is not healing at the rate that it should. And I still ended up messing up one of my nipples a bit, but it's another story. But yeah, I kind of expected there to be people that I could turn to if I needed them once I got back home a week after surgery. And then I got back home and I found myself very alone. And the people in my life, it wasn't their fault. It's not like they deliberately were like, well, fuck you, Aaron. Like, like it wasn't, it wasn't like that. It was just other people have their lives too. And they have their priorities and their commitments and like, you know, work and school and like things that they absolutely need to do and um, things that they can't just drop. Or if they do drop them, there will be consequences. And like, they just weren't able to do that. And I guess they didn't realize when they said that they would be there for me or when they said like, of course, yeah, if you need anything, let me know. I don't think they realized what that actually meant, like what that would entail and that I needed daily care. Uh, so I got home and I already had this really weird, disappointing experience in Florida and then my post-op reveal had me feeling all messed up and self-conscious and I felt again very powerless and I get home and the people I was relying on weren't there because they had their own lives to get back to and then out of the blue my mom pulls through. I didn't mean for that to rhyme but it did. My mom did a full 180. I got home from surgery and she was here every single day every day. Every day she would shower me. Trigger warning surgery. My incisions weren't healing quickly and the holes where the drains were took a really, really, really long time to close and it made it extremely painful for me to even try to lift my arm up because the hole was, it was open. Other people's bodies eventually close. I put some neosporin on it in a band-aid. My body's not like that. My body has a wound and the wound will expand until it creates scar tissue and it stays in that shape. It's not the best situation. So there was that and my nipple grafts, I was really afraid they were gonna fall off because my body wasn't healing quickly enough so the skin was just there and just kind of dying and like it's normal for your nipple grafts to like the skin that's on your nipples when you get the graft is going to peel off and there will be nipples under that because the cells are going to regenerate and like it's this whole thing but like my body was just really not doing a great job with that so I was just worried that like my nipples were gonna fly off and like the stitches were um coming out but like my body wasn't creating the new skin quickly enough so like that's one of my nipples is a little messed up because like the stitch came out but the skin underneath it 
hadn't healed as quickly as it was supposed to, so like there's kind of like this weird empty spot, but like it's fine, it's not super noticeable because of the prominent scarring, and I just didn't treat that one area, so it stayed red. So like, that's good, because it just looks like nipple, but it's scar tissue. So my mom was here every day and she helped me shower and she would cut up fresh fruits and veggies and make sure that I had food within reach and I had water, like a bunch of bottles that had already, like the, the seal had been broken so I could drink from them, and made sure that I had clean clothes and nothing was out of reach and my environment was clean. Like she really went above and beyond and took care of me in all the ways that I had really wished I would have had that first week of surgery. So it was kind of this mixed emotional experience for me because there was this let down that I couldn't help but feel from my loved ones and then this huge surprise of my mom loving me so much but I had already come to terms in my mind with being in a place where like I didn't need her and it was okay and like I would rely on these other people and it's okay if she rejects me or doesn't accept this or like just you know I got ready for that because she wasn't willing to come with me for surgery I was just sort of ready for the worst and it ended up not being that way and the people I was relying on weren't there and the person I wasn't relying on was there and it's like it was so hard for me to wrap my brain around because I just went into this place of fear of like well you're taking care of me but like what if one day you don't what if we start to backpedal and like I start to face rejection again or like you know what if things go badly again and we're not on good terms and I would be in this situation and I would need this so badly and the people I thought I would get it from aren't here like you're the only one willing to do this for me so I felt so I felt so loved and so terrified at the same time because this was exactly what I needed but it's coming from the person I didn't expect it to come from so it felt terrifying because I didn't feel any stability in that relationship I didn't feel Feel like oh well if this happened again I could rely on this it's like it didn't it felt like a happy accident and that just made me feel awful because it just felt like well yeah I got lucky because you were here and you've decided to do this but if you weren't here who would clearly no one would and that made me feel really alone because I already came to terms with the idea that you wouldn't be here and now you are here and I'm so happy you're here but like oh like it was such a place to be in in my mind so that was really hard. And through that experience, to recap the other videos, I learned to communicate. I now know if I ever have surgery again, first of all, I'm bringing an army with me. I am going to have a lot of people there. I don't want one person to be responsible for my well-being. I don't want to put that on one person. I don't want to feel guilty for keeping one person up all night every night. Um, I want to know that if there are some tasks that one person can't handle, like things that are a little too gory or a little too hands-on, that I could pass that task off onto someone else and I'm not guilting anyone else into doing something they're not comfortable with. I want to know that if one person has to deal with their own issues during my surgery, that there's someone else I could fall back on and that they could go ahead and take care of themselves. They're just, I know I need a lot of people there. And I also need to make sure that I have a long talk with everyone who's going to be at my surgery so they know what to expect and they know what I expect them to do and what I request that they don't do. And if they can't handle that, then they're under no obligation to be that person. They don't have to be there. That's okay. They're allowed to not be there. So yeah, my healing process was learning to communicate. I spoke to the people who took care of me afterwards and they all know how I feel and how things went and we've all grown since then and like I've learned to communicate way better and something really important in your relationships is being able to talk to each other without getting mad at the other person for having the audacity to be hurt. You get what I'm saying? Like the people you love, you're gonna hurt them and they're going to hurt you and you need to be able to talk about that and not take it as an attack. That's so important. So that's a lot of my emotional advice for top surgery pre and post-op. In my next video, even though it's not entirely related, I will definitely talk about post-op care as someone with EDS in terms of like scar care, because I think that's really important. I tried a lot of things, so I'll just make a short video about that. But this is the end of my emotional preparation for surgery uh, series. I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope you all take care of yourselves and each other, and I hope you're feeling okay. And I really appreciate you watching. All right, thanks. Take care.